I actually got dinner with George earlier, and uh, George finds filmmaking a hobby, so I found that really interesting. He's produced multiple films. I saw um, Out of the Fire, one of his most recent ones, and that was incredible. It's on YouTube, so we'll give you guys a link after. If, if you love this, I implore you to watch that one as well. It's also very, very heart-wrenching, very sobering. So, um, going on to the panel, um, we heard about your story, basically, from coming to Staten Island. So, can you explain what the conditions are like in Liberia right now? Uh, pretty much is much better compared to 14 years ago. Right. Uh, I mean, the, in terms of like employment and economic, it's still pretty terrible. Right. Like, uh, I believe like almost like eighty percent of the population is still uneducated. Right. So, you know, because like over here we go from high from elementary school to high school, you go to school for free. Over there, your family pretty much have to pay for education, and, you know, from kindergarten all the way to you know high school. You pretty much have to pay for it. Um, I believe last week I got a call from my from my aunt, and she was like, "Oh, your cousin needs money in order to you know pay for his tuition, and he's just in the eighth grade." And I was like, "How much is the tuition?" It's like a hundred dollars. So a hundred dollars over there is a lot of money. Um, so pretty much, if if your child, if your family is not fortunate enough, you, know, you pretty much have no future. So I remember being in that situation, like. When when I was coming up in Liberia, um, my grandmother, in order to like you know educate us, she actually got somebody from neighbor from the neighborhood to tutor us because we couldn't afford to go to school. Right. So, but things are getting better a little bit. Right. George and I have actually have a bunch of courses in common. We're taking courses on like urban economics yeah, yeah, yeah. and even French and everything like that. So we've realized that. Education is really like the most important like factor to like society, and yeah. I think you're definitely you're definitely a testament to that. So, how do you think growing up in New York has shaped your perspective, and what challenges have you faced as a result of that? Um, growing up in New York, uh, it kind of opened my eyes to a whole lot of different opportunities. Right. Uh, coming from a country where you have to pay for your education, and then coming to the New York to the United States, where you know education is free, I was kind of shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow, I can't believe this, you know. Right. Um, I always tell, like, most of my friends, like, um, like, everybody is, like, you know, everybody have their best friend. Um, my best friend is hope, but my first love is education because, you know, coming from my country, you know, you don't, if you don't have education, you have a future. So being, living in New York, you know, is an eye-opening, you know, experience for anybody. You know, you get to see. You know, you wake up in the morning. You don't have to, you know, hear the sound of guns. You know, guns. You don't have to hear people shooting. Right. So, you know, that was something that, you know, when I first came, it, you know, opened my eyes, made me realize that, you know, I can pretty much use the take these opportunity and make myself, right. You know, I can help myself become somebody. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. So, uh, going off of that, could you explain uh, your time at like Brooklyn College and how you how you get involved with the refugee crisis there? All right. Uh, at Brooklyn College, um, so like I said, I, I worked for the school. I work. I'm an assistant to the you know VP. Right. So each time I get like different flyers, I would actually post them on cam on on the campus bulletin board like flyers from the UN, flyers from, you know, the Refugee Congress. Right. So in, in, in a lot of ways is to help, you know, you know, make this make students aware of, you know, what's going on in the world. Right. And like recently there was a flyer about, you know, uh, a petition from the U from the United Nation about us, you know, the about you know, sign if you sign this petition you can, you know, change help change, you know, the the, the crisis in Syria. So we got almost a lot of people, you know, on campus to sign the petition. So, you know, it, it made me feel, you know, good that, you know, I'm doing something like that just to bring awareness to what's going on in Syria. Right. Oh, very nice. So you mentioned Refugee Congress. Could you go over, I know you're a New York delegate for that, yes. so could you go over, like, their operations and what they did? All right, so the Refugee Congress was pretty much established, like, I believe, 2011. Yeah. So as a New York de um, delegate, 
I pretty much advocate for refugees. So I, I actually were as appear to different organizations like the uh, the International Rescue Committee or you know um, HIAS, which I told you guys about. Yep. So I appear there at different events or go volunteering at you know whatever they need me to do. So right. I appear to those places that they want me to go up here and just volunteer. And sometimes I might have to like speak on like my job, my yep. volunteer experience as an advocate or so. You know, just tell them like, oh, this is what I do. And I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing speaking for people who don't, you know, have a voice, but it's something that I'm passionate about, especially like, helping people. So it's something that I love doing. So Refugee Congress, you know, they pretty much implored former refugees to work for them on a volunteer basis. So we're not necessarily getting paid for it, but we do it in the sense that we were, we were once, you know, refugees. We, we know what it's like to be, you know, a refugee, what it's like to go, you know, out. We know what it's like to struggle pretty much. So we speak on behalf of people, you know, who have who been to the exact same situation as us? So refugee Congress, they were employed, you know, like mentor for pe people to mentor us through our journey and through also uh, helping in our neighborhood. Uh, recently, I got the chance to meet um, Don Donovan, okay. the representative of you know Staten, Staten Island. Yeah. So you know we, we we talk about you know ways to help you know refugee in New York. So it's, it's still in the works, pretty much. Ah, oh, very interesting. And I remember reading that you do a lot of work with like uh, refugees that that, that recently come to the U.S. So, um, based off that, what have you learned, and what have been like their biggest points of adversity, and how do you really help with that? Uh, for a lot of refugee who come to the United States, I, I think one of the biggest challenges it's not just the the, the language barrier, right. but also employment. Um, you have people who used to be you know doctors and lawyers back in their country, and then they come to the United States, they realize they have to start all over. Right. For for kids, when I came here, I was like, you know, seven years old. It, it's easier for us because we can adapt so quickly compared to our parents. Yep. Um, so I'm sitting in the cab and I'm listening to a guy who who live in Sierra Leone. Why in Sierra Leone? He was a, a, a banker and now he's a cab driver in the United States. Right. So you look at situations like that and you realize the system, there's, there's need to be a change in the system, but adults who come in the United States as refugees, they need more help compared to the kids. Yeah. Because we can go to school and adapt to the American way of life you know, within a few seconds, but then you know, adults, they, they just can't because there are not a lot of resources out there to help them. Um, for example, my, my aunt who was a nurse in Liberia before she came to the United States. She, when she came, she had to start all over. She, like she literally had to go back to school in order to become, you know, the exact, in order to do the exact same job she was doing in my country. So yeah. the system need, there's, needs to be a change in the system or at least there has to be some sort of program where people who, let's say if you were a doctor in Liberia or in, you know, in Jordan and you come here, there has to be some sort of program where instead of going back to school full time, at least there has to be like a program where they can retrain you so that you can be able to work in the United States, in the U.S. system. Yeah. You know, that would be a much easier process than going back to school for another four to eight years. Yeah, oh, that's a great idea. So given all like all the points of adversity you, you hear from like everyone you encounter and like obviously your own personal perspective, how do you remain so positive? Because you're like one of the most jovial people I've ever met. I love talking to you. <laughs> I mean, um, how do I remain positive? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, I remember getting mugged once at Brooklyn College on my way to to school early in the morning. Yeah. And instead of getting angry, uh, upset, I mean, it did traumatize me, but. You know, um, instead of not doing anything about it, I actually ran for student government. Even though I didn't win, but I did help people win. So, my 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 agenda was to 
was to help, you know, to make security better on campus. Right. They like started a, a pen pal where, you know, students walk around with some, like a button, so whenever they're in trouble, they can press it and security will know exactly where they are. Okay. So, when I'm, so I stayed positive in this, in the sense that I, you know, I associate myself or align myself with people who are doing positive things on campus. Um, I work for, you know, the central deposit, central depository system um, department. So they pretty much uh, work with different clubs. So when, when, when I first went to Brooklyn College, I didn't really know how the system worked. Yeah. Like clubs, activity, I didn't know how they work on campus. Right. So I kind of got lost in the laws in the system yeah so now when 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 new student comes in and they need to know what's you know where this place is on campus or how to like start a club i'm able to advise them and tell them hey this is where you go so stuff like that help keep me positive knowing that i can I, you know, help other students just like me awesome yeah yeah i really think the strongest thing is building community and i think that's how we get awareness out there too advocacy yeah. so uh given given that um how can college students help just like us like and organizations like hope for humanity like what goals do you have specifically for us and how can people be involved on a personal basis um i think compared to our ge our generation compared to our parent generation what we have is technology our parents didn't have that they didn't have like twitter they didn't have instagram they didn't have youtube um what's the other stuff out there <laughs> Yeah, I think Twitter, yeah. YouTube, and Instagram, yeah. and all this other thing. Yeah. So Facebook, right? So we could utilize those things by, by, um, you know, getting other people aware of situation like you know refugee, yep, um, the crisis that going on in Syria. I don't think, like today for our generation, everything is a trending topic. So if you remember a few years back, um, the biggest trending topic was pray for our, bring our girls back. Mm -hmm. And then after that was pray for Paris. And right. then, and now the biggest one is Black Lives Matter. Yep. So <coughs> everything can go back, you know, can go away like that. People can forget stuff like that. Yep. So to for people, for our generation to get involved, we have to like, you know, stay focused. Um, stay focused, um, get people involved back. You know, volunteering, you know, volunteering, um, just and, and just being active out there. It's like you have to like. Life is about you know who wants it the most. Right. Yeah. I agree. Um, for me, that's what that's what it's about. Yeah. You have to, if you want to win, you have to show people that you want it so bad. You know, so if you want to stay involved and be active, you have to show people that you really that you're so passionate about this, that you do anything, you know, you do anything to help other people. Right. And I think that's the greatest gift you could ever give to anybody, a helping hand. Right. So, you just, you utilize what you have. And technology is like your biggest weapon. Your pen and the paper is the biggest weapon. Um, be a great writer. A great writer is a great thinker. So, if you are able to you know, use Twitter and Instagram and take pictures and, po and post it up. You shouldn't have a problem just writing something like, um, writing something like, uh, or bring our girls back, or helps pray for Syria. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. So you can get aware. Of, you you know you can get involved just by helping, right, by using you know the technology in the right way. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. Like I'm sure you you know what's going on with um, Syria recently. Mm -hmm. Like that's been most people's like point of contact for that whole crisis. Just people like looking at trending topics and everything like that. Right. It's it's really like it's a really harrowing story. Like you see like all these personal twitters and all right. it doesn't even seem real at some points. So yeah, I definitely think we should leverage that. And I think you're doing an excellent job of that. And we're definitely going to take your model and definitely going to run with it. So, George, thank you so much. Those are all of my questions, but um, if anyone else has any questions for George, just, we're going to open it up now. Don't be shy. Yeah, I have one. Yep. Um, so, from what I understand, you came to the U.S. through your family? Yes. 
Uh, what kind of confounds me is, you know, they say, what, 1% or less than 1% of Syrian refugees get resettled, mm -hmm. or refugees get resettled, period. Uh, like, how, how do you, like, possibly get picked for this process? Like, you know, if you're in a camp or whatever, how do you get, so, like, selected, for lack of better words? Like, I don't understand how, like, through this training communication, millions of people, maybe only a couple thousand, get to move to, you know, Iowa or to Staten Island where right. you did. Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, what people out there don't know, uh, what people out there don't know is that there are so many different organizations that actually resettle refugees. But the main organization that really, you know, that are really involved in resettling refugees is the International Rescue Committee and also um, the Lutheran War Service. They are very big in, you know, those two organizations that I know really about. I know well enough about that. They are very big in resettling refugees. Um, my family were resettled by the Lutheran War Service. But in terms of resettling a refugee, it's also about you know your situation. I mean, there are people who are living in a refugee camp for almost like 20 years. So it depends on your story. Uh, some people leave their country for political, to escape political prosecution. My family, we escaped to us. We escaped Liberia to, you know, to avoid political prosecution because my grandfather was a police officer. So they were actually the the rebel forces were actually looking for people to prosecute who actually have you know family ties in the government. So that I think organization look at your story and it look at your situation in terms of resettling. So. It's not always who come. It's not always first come first serve. It's about your situation, like reason why we should resettle you. You have to give a legitimate reason why you should be resettled in the United States. Yeah, awesome. very nice. Yeah, great question. A good follow up to that is actually um, me and one of my founders. Uh, we actually went to MoMA the other day, and there's a whole exhibit on uh, resettled refugees. And it gives you a lot of perspective because it gives you, it shows you like the tents they're put in and like the different like aid packages that are offered. Right. So I definitely encourage all of you to go to that. Um, it's up until like I think the 21st or so. So definitely check that out. Um, UNHCR is also a part of that, which is an organization we're partnering with. That's how I actually got to know George. Yes. So I think we have time for one more question if anyone wants to take that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, is it really encouraging for you as a delegate to the Refugee Congress, uh, seeing a lot of the positivity around you know, the movement? I mean, especially because there are young know, refugees from all around the world, but you know, right now, of course, the focus is on Syria. But is it really encouraging to see all that you know positivity? Yeah, it, it is. It's, you know, encouraged me and motivated me to you know get out there and just you know be involved in different social activities that are going on, in, not just in the United States, but also around the entire world. Um, like I said earlier, I'm like so passionate about helping other people because I know where I came from. Like somebody did, we had to put their life down, you know, in order for me to be here today. So I know, you know, what it means to, you know, just you know, extend a helping hand to another person. and. I mean, the Refugee Congress is a great organization, it's very young, you know, and they give me the opportunity to be a you know, delegate to represent New York. So I'm trying to use that as much as possible. In my neighborhood, you know, a few years ago, I did a code drive, and this year, I, I don't know exactly what I want to do yet, but I'm still trying to figure out figure things out. You know, being a college student, it really, there's so much stress being a, being a, you know, you have your college work and then you go into, you go into school, I mean, you go into school and then you, you have your side job. So all of that, you know, is, is very stressful, you know. Doesn't really keep your mind stable because you're like literally everywhere. You know? But uh, Refugee Congress, it is a great up. Um, it's, it gave me a great opportunity, but and it's something that I I, I pretty much want to do in the future. Maybe work for the Refugee Congress or 
the UNHCR or maybe the International Rescue Committee because the, those organizations are very dedicated to helping people and that's something I want to keep doing. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely excited for partnering with Refugee Congress. Can't wait to get the process started. So I saw a bunch of hands up, so let's just do one final question and then go for it. Yeah. Um, so taking the current political climate into consideration, what with Trump as like the president-elect and his like unfriendly stance on like immigrations and like Muslims, like how does that affect you, I guess like personally or like your community, like the refugee community? Hmm. That's a good question, you know. I mean, when Trump won the election, a lot of people were scared. But, you know, people people panic based on of emotion. But a lot of people don't really know how the, the system works. There's a system of check and balance. And people tend to forget that because they're so in an emotion. But um, Trump winning, you know, um, it opened your eyes to a lot of things. It make you see America in a whole different fashion, different way. Um, now, um, when you wake up in the morning and you look at your neighbor and your neighbor is white, what do you say to your neighbor? Like, how can you do this to me? <laughs> do you say that? Or do you just, um, do you, do you, will you really say that? Like, how can you do this to me? Or would you, you know, try to understand that not all white people are racist? There are black people who are also racist too. Um, it's the same thing over and over. I mean, Trump. I I don't know him personally, but you know from his history, I know that he's a very hardworking person. You know, um, very wealthy. Um, who have who have be friendly with somebody like Trump? No. I can just you know just look at the things he said. You know. It kind of like make me look at you know the United States in a different way. Like how can we, how can we choose somebody like this? How can we let somebody like this? Like it's kind of like watching the Matrix, the blue pill <laughs> and the red pill. A lot of people choose the red pill, right? A lot of people choose the red pill. It's like going backwards in you know in history. Like is it a slap in the face for a lot of people? Some people think it's a slap in the face for you know, for black people, but like I said, not all white people are racist. I mean, I'm adopted, you know, by white by, by this white family in Long Island, and you know, over the years they have treated me like a son, you know, and still my image of white people would never change because I know there are good white people out there, the same way there are good black people out there. And Trump being president doesn't really change my view so much about the United States because I know this is the only country you can pretty much go to where you can have a Jew and a Muslim living next door to each other, or a Christian and a, a Buddhist living next door to each other. I don't think you can go to Russia or any other country in the world and see, you know, a Jew and a Muslim living next door to each other. <clears throat> and that's the great thing about this country. No matter who's the president, I mean, we all just have to hope and pray that, you know, things do get better and not go, you know, sideways. Great. See, that's how you stay positive. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Very nice. Okay, George. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Thank it's you. always a pleasure. Thank you.